everybody abstracts a different reality. When you come through a room, you abstract the reality you're prepared to abstract. You pick up the signals that interest you, and your brain records them and organizes them. We all have our own reality tunnel, and in our reality tunnel, we uh, pick out some things and ignore other things. And we've got 10 billion cells in our brain receiving hundreds and hundreds of millions of signals all the time. We just pick out the ones that fit into the established grooves in our brain, the, the reality tunnel that's been laid down by past experience. We all have our own belief system, and the signals that fit our belief system get in. The signals that don't fit our belief system get ignored, or if they keep coming back, we go to a psychiatrist to get cured and make them go away. Once you get used to thinking in terms of the tuned in and the not tuned in, then all the problems in philosophy about being and non-being and so on seem absolutely nonsensical. We don't know what is or what isn't. All we know is what we tuned in and what we didn't tune in. If you keep track of, who, of what you tuned in, you know, you know, that's what you can talk about meaningfully. What you didn't tune in, you can only make guesses about, or noises, or garbles, or frantic hand gestures. But you, you can't really know anything about them. You only know what you've tuned in. Now, what you haven't tuned in is not necessarily non-existent. It's just not tuned in. So I said, that takes care of the whole problem of being and non-being, which Western philosophers have been debating for the last 2,500 years. You don't know anything about being or non-being. All you know is what you tuned in. Bucky Fuller, I seem to be a very... I can't find any constant rough in it on Wilson. It seems to be a process of change all the time. I'm certainly not the guy I was at 40. You know, I'm certainly not the kid I was in Catholic school at 7 or 8. I started out in a little tiny Irish Catholic ghetto in, in Brooklyn or Long Island, I'm not sure which. <laughs> and somehow I have traveled from Maui in the east to Berlin in the west, which is half of the time zones on the planet. And I feel like as, as I've expanded my travel in space, I've expanded my travel through the world of ideas also. I can't believe I started out a, a good Catholic school boy. <laughs> there must have been some good times. Well, I think of my childhood, I just remember the, how frightened I was of the nuns and the school I went to, how sadistic they were. There was so much mystery and ambiguity about everything. Everybody, that's why there's so much in my novels. But Adolf never gave a straight answer to a child about anything. Everything was lies, hypocrisy, evasions. I knew there was, I knew there was something going on they were hiding from me, and it used to scare me. I wasn't quite sure what it was. Uh, it might have something to do with the Wolfman or the Frankenstein monster. I didn't know what the hell it was. And I didn't trust them at all. At one, at one point, something around seven or eight, they admitted there was no Santa Claus. And as soon as I recovered from the shock, my next thought is, when are they going to admit there's no God? They never did. And I went back to believing in God under the hammering and pounding of the nuns up until I was about... 13, I guess. I was a very obedient child. Everybody agrees to that. Everybody I can remember from my childhood. I started rebelling in my teens, and I'm rebelling more, more every year. I remember I know how old I was, 14, 15, another unbeliever in myself. 
I broke one tack got into an argument with a student who was still a Catholic. He said, if you really believe what you say, you would have the courage to ask God to strike you dead right now to prove that you, that you, that you believe he doesn't exist. And I, I got scared for a minute, then I went ahead and did it, and nothing happened, and I felt totally liberated. Fuck you, you're not there after all. That was a great moment of liberation, which I hardly ever recalled until tonight. My God, a very important turning point in my life. Here's to the good nuns for telling me what books not to read. Interacting processing. Interacting processing. Interacting processing. Friends, everything the Pope Bob does puts things into a perspective. And not just a new perspective, but the correct perspective! Because it includes all other perspectives. And so, my friends, I'm very happy and proud to present the Carl Sagan of religion. assembly line workers, and folks, the Robert Anton Wilson of humanity. Praise Spectacles, testicles, brandy, cigars, you're all popes. You're all absolutely infallible. I have the authority to appoint anybody a Discordian Pope because I'm a Discordian Pope. The first rule after you become a Discordian Pope is to excommunicate every Discordian Pope you meet. This is based on the basic Discordian principle, we Discordians must stick apart. Discordians don't have dogmas, uh, which are absolute beliefs. We have catmas, which are relative meta-beliefs. And uh, the, the central Discordian catma is, as I said before, uh, any affirmation is true in some sense, false in some sense, meaningless in some sense, true and false in some sense, true and meaningless in some sense, false and meaningless in some sense, and true and false and meaningless in some sense. And if you repeat this 666 times, you will achieve supreme enlightenment in some, <laughs> in some sense. There are approximately 12 million Discordian popes now. Originally, Balaclips the Younger, the founder of Discordianism, had cards printed and uh, he'd just hand them out to everybody he met, making them popes. And then I printed the Pope card in the Illuminatus Trilogy. But then I was living in Ireland and uh, the Pope came to Phoenix Park and announced, the guy who thinks he's the only Pope, uh, he announced that bishops could give indulgences over television which was a new thing in Catholic doctrine. And I got the idea, well, if they can do indulgences on television, I can do pontifications. And so instead of giving out cards, every time I got on radio or television, I made the whole audience popes. Eventually, we'll make every man, woman, and child on this planet a pope. Most religious people take themselves too damn seriously, which is why they act like such damn fools. I'm using the word damn deliberately for the paradoxical effect. Like I'm also a Buddhist, a Taoist, and a Confucian, as well as a Discordian, a subgenius, and a witch. I will officially announce that everybody in this room is now a Discordian Pope, just like me. <laughs> Testicles, testicles, brandy, cigars. Testicles, testicles, brandy, cigars. You are all absolutely infallible and don't take crap from anybody. Okay. Here we are.
Well, I'm, a, I'm an ordained pope of the church of a sub-genius, which means I'm absolutely infallible, so don't dare contradict anything I say. As for my relationship with Ivan Stein, I deny all the rumors. <laughs> Remember, you're only infallible about your own nervous system. You know what's going on in your own nervous system, what, you, what realities you're creating out of the infinite flux of being. You don't know anything about anybody else's reality unless they tell you about it. You've got to listen very sympathetically to understand them. See, so it's a limited infallibility. Über Quantumphysik, aber ich kann euch nicht garantieren, dass ich das übersetzen kann. Ich glaube, der soll einfach losreden. She wants to know what quantum physics is. What? Quantum physics. What, what? Explain it simply, she asked. Explain quantum physics simply. Uh, uh, when I moved from Los Angeles, I moved into what I thought was Santa Cruz. Then we had something stolen from our car, and we called the police. And it turned out we didn't live in Santa Cruz. We lived in a town called Capitola. The post office thought we lived in Santa Cruz. But the police thought we lived in Capitola. I started investigating this, and a reporter on the local newspaper told me we didn't live in either Santa Cruz or Capitola. We lived in an unincorporated area called Live Oak. Now, quantum mechanics is just like that, except that in the case of Santa Cruz, Capitola, and Live Oak, we don't get too confused because we remember we invented the lines on the map. But quantum physics seems confusing because a lot of people think we didn't invent the lines. So it seems hard to understand how a particle can be in three places at the same time without being anywhere at all. But when you remember that we invented all the boundaries, borders, and lines just like the Berlin Wall, then quantum mechanics is no more mysterious than the fact that I live in three places at the same time. No Chinese raised on I Ching has ever found quantum mechanics puzzling. It's only puzzling to people raised on Aristotelian logic with things that are either A or not A. In the evening, things are A and not A at the same time. With quantum mechanics, you can prove that light is made out of particles experimentally. You can build up a whole mathematical theory of light traveling in little particles called photons, and you can do experiments, and the experiments will give you a pattern showing that light is traveling like particles. We've also got a whole mathematical theory built up showing that light travels as waves. And we've got experiments that will show you that light travels as waves. As one uh, physicist in the 1920s said, it looks as if the damn light is waiting to see how we're going to do the experiment and then deciding which way it's going to travel. <laughs> Schrodinger said, I wish I never got mixed up with this verdompter quantum springer eye, this goddamn quantum jumping. The modified Copenhagen view is light is neither waves nor particles until we look, and then it, uh, then it adjusts itself depending on what we're looking at it with. An electron is not anywhere until we look. And when we look, the electron decides to be somewhere as long as we're looking. As soon as we stop looking, the electron is everywhere again. Every model we make uh, tells us how our mind works. It, uh, as much as it tells us about the universe. These are, these are just uh, human uh, symbolic games. Mm -hmm. The universe itself uh, is bigger than any of our models. According to Zen Buddhism and most forms of Buddhism and quantum mechanics, any description of the universe which leaves you out is inaccurate because any description of the universe is a description of the instrument that you use to take your reading of the universe. And if the only instrument you use is your own nervous system, you've got to include your own nervous system in your description of the universe. So, ergo, any model we make does not describe the universe. It describes what our brains are capable of saying at this time. <laughs>